The British people appear not to have a consensus about who should lead them. We want to talk about the personality of those possible leaders. Let's start with the current Prime Minister, David Cameron, someone in your time at The Economist I know you got to know well. Tell us about, about what David Cameron's like and about his prime ministership, uh, what has brought him to this point of great peril. Well, he, Cameron is very calm, um, very good under pressure. After the last election, there was a moment nobody had an overall majority. He was incredibly good at dealing with that. Um, sometimes that very kind of slick management drifts into complacency. And one of his problems in the election is that he's surrounded, frankly, by lots of people who look and talk like me. And strangely, that is that, not that, necessarily... That is a problem. <laughs> that is not necessarily something which the British public warn to. And he's slightly given the impression, not, not wholly accurately, that government is one of those things you do with your chums, and that's the way it works. It's, that's not wholly fair on him. He is, he's good at taking tough decisions in some places, and he's good at getting himself out of, out of holes, a bit like Bill Clinton. Do people think that he has been on, on the merits of what he promised to do five years ago and what he's delivered? Do people think he's been successful, or do they think he's fallen short in terms of delivering on those promises? It's the really odd thing, is in terms of has he done what he said he'd do? Yes, pretty much. He promised it would be hard. He promised he'd fix the economy. He's done that. And if you ask the British people who's the better leader, they go to David Cameron, if you say, what's your main issue? They say the economy. Who's better on the economy? David Cameron. So that's, it, 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 if you looked at it from the outside, you talk to a lot of American pollsters, they just say, surely Cameron's going to pull away. He, he's passing all the tests you would expect an incumbent to pa pass, but he's not breaking through. So the man who's poised to maybe stop him, the labor leader, Ed Miliband, is part of a political family very familiar mm. to the country for a long time. Is he uh, a, a someone running on personality? Is he running on issues? It's interesting. He's running on something, a kind of version of inequality, a version of sort of fairness. And he has done, he has gone out and he has selected a kind of consortium of people. It's a very, in a very strange way, it's a bit like Karl Rove years ago assembling the Bush coalition. He's gone off and found individual people. He's gone and grabbed um, students. He's promised them things. He's told pensioners you're going to get this. He's told people who are unemployed you're going to get this. Benefits, people who work for the public sector. And he's sort of got a blocking coalition together and that is the way that he's been going and he's continually attacked Cameron that he's someone who's out of touch with the people and in a strange way the first sort of beginning of the campaign Miliband did very well recently he's got into trouble about this thing to do with the Scots Nats but he's not personally popular we've Scot seen Scots Nats being yeah. the Scottish, Scottish National Nationalist. Party yeah we've, he, we've seen past British elections where one of the two major candidates was clearly more likable mm. it's not clear to me from my own point of view or from the British people, who's more likable between the two of them? The, really odd, the, the really odd thing is in British politics, all the most likable people are the people outside. People liked Alex Salmond in Scotland. They quite like Nicola Sturgeon, the new SNP leader. They love Boris Johnson. Nigel Farage, the UKIP guy, has a kind of blokish image. The two people at the top, people don't go for. What was really odd about this election is that we had Britain, which was a place where you just thought it was two parties, one gets elected, one doesn't. Now suddenly you have everything reversed and you have everything turned upside down. Labour is based in Scotland. Scotland is where it comes from. In this election they could lose pretty much every single Scottish seat they have and yet Miliband could end up in Downing Street and that is like Hillary Clinton losing New York and California but still carrying the election and it is very very odd. Say a little bit more about Ed, you know one of the things that people don't or most people don't follow British politics don't know is that he has a brother mm. who also wanted to be Prime Minister or leader of the Labour Party. He had to kind of shove his brother aside in order to be in the position he is now. That speaks to a certain kind of uh, coldness and a, a, a ruthlessness um, that doesn't necessarily come across in his, pu in his public persona. I saw his brothers in New York, I saw him a couple of days ago in a restaurant he, and he is stuck in a very strange position. David Miliband was the chosen Miliband. Yeah. He was also Blair's chosen heir. And during all those times of Gordon Brown, a sort of slightly dysfunctional leader, whenever there was a plot, it was always about bringing in David Miliband. And then the moment the election went, suddenly he was pushed ago. out. Yeah. He was pushed. David, the, the, there was a, a race. And everyone expected Ed Miliband to support his brother, instead of which he ran against him. And it is really Cain and Abel. And, and, and actually, that's a problem for Ed Miliband. If you ask voters what do they know about him, the first thing they know is that he, he knifed his brother. Uh, outcome have any implication for the United States? I think it must do because Britain, whatever its pluses and minuses, is still incredibly close ally. It's still the people you'd rely on in terms of defense. Cameron hasn't been spending enough on it. Miliband looks if he spent even less. There's a whole issue about Britain and Europe. You know, whatever happens, you could end up with Britain 
at the worst, you could see Britain coming apart. You're either going to end up in this election, if the polls are right, with Cameron governing in London, but with no support whatsoever in Scotland and Scotland run by the Scots Nats, or else Miliband governing in London with the help of Scottish MPs, the Scottish Nationalist MPs, who English voters cannot have no control over. The Scots can vote on English issues, the English can't vote on Scots. And so you will have growing resentment, growing fury in England about what's happening because England gives Scotland a lot of money. Growing fury so or just, quite a, a, lot of, it's, it's fury a, or just a lot of hilarity. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> me. Let, me ask, let me ask you a last question. We have about 30 seconds. If you think about these two guys, the likelihood is, like if we believe the betting sites and, and Ladbrokes, that we're going to have a hung election. There's no one's going to have a majority yeah. government. So which of these two guys has the political resourcefulness, the more likely, have the political resourcefulness to have the likelihood of being able to cobble together a coalition government? Most people would probably still say Cameron because he did it before. What Cameron has, that he has a very good ability to lose something, think, OK, that's happened. I've lost my vote on Syria. I didn't get a majority in the election, and then do something quickly. Against that, everyone who underrated David, Ed Miliband, that, you see, I, I say the wrong <laughs> Miliband by instinct, everyone who underrated him, you know, he is, he is now quite close or stands a decent chance, a far better chance than anybody thought of getting into number 10.